Welcome to Breaking Eggs with Seth Shezzy. Breaking Eggs is a visual podcast where Seth talks to creative entrepreneurs, designers, seekers, healers, and thought leaders. During these candid and insightful chats, Seth teases out some nuggets from his exceptional guests that are sure to inspire, entertain, and make you go, huh, when you hear their unique methods of pursuing fulfillment. I am Seth Shezzy. Join me every week as I crack open the lives and learnings of some very special guests. On this episode, I speak to Victor Snyder, CEO and co-founder of Skin Review. <laughs> Good morning, Victor. Good morning, Seth. How are you? Excellent. Good. Uh, what is it that makes me feel like I've known you for so long? Uh, maybe we just come at life from the same kind of angle. What angle is that? Positive energy? I think positive energy is part of it, but um, you you create your own reality. Yeah. And um, that's the kind of world to live in because if we are too conscious of every last little thing that is happening as yeah. around us, yeah. uh, you just want to slit your wrists. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, you've, it's, just, it's especially true when you, when you drive a company mm. because people look to you for the inspiration and positivity. And if you go around moaning about politics or corruption or the state of, the nation or yeah. anything like that. Um, we do it as well with our patients. Um, when patients come in and they want to have a moan session about security and load shedding and course, water, yeah. we say, you know, we, we know those things are going on, but let's talk about something that's great that's happening in your life, mm. something you can be thankful for. Yeah, shift and, the perspective. And shift the perspective. So if you surround yourself with positivity, um, you create a better energy around you. Amazing. It just makes life easier. And is that something you've come into later in life or have you always felt that way? <clears throat> so I, I have a saying that I go by. Um, when I was 20, I thought my father was a fool. <laughs> okay. When I was 30, I was amazed at how much he'd learned in 10 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so with perspective again. Yeah. Thankfully, with age comes a little bit of wisdom yeah. because you'll end up paying a lot more school fees. Yes. And you've taken a few more knocks. Yes. And, um, you know, as a kid, I used to love listening to old people's stories. Okay. Because they always seemed so wise. And then you move out of childhood, at yeah. which point you know it all. Mm. And nobody can tell you anything. Yeah. And then it takes you a good 15, 20, 25 years to realize that maybe you don't know it all. And then the learning starts all over again. And, and now, so with age comes a little bit of wisdom, I suppose. Now, I have to assume you weren't always this beautifully distilled. There must have been a time where you thought, <laughs> what am I doing? What's my purpose? Where am I going? And what did that feel like? And at what point did that change? Absolutely. I call it, uh, it was named after a, a Douglas Adams book who wrote Two Chagas Guide okay. to the Galaxy. And he wrote yeah, another book called it. The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul. Don't know that one. And I had my Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, it happened in mid-40s. Okay. Uh, some people would have called it a midlife crisis, but I had followed the script. Mm. I went to school, I studied, I got a job, mm. I got married, I got the 2.4 cars and the 1.8 children yes. and the cat and the dog and the swimming pool and the house. You're like an insurer's and, dream. And I ticked every mm. box that was supposed to be ticked. Yeah. Started my own business. And suddenly in my mid-40s, I realized I wasn't happy. Okay. Um, life just didn't have a purpose. It was a box ticking exercise. And I didn't really feel that outside of ticking boxes that I'd actually achieved anything. And I didn't feel that I'd grown. Wow. Uh, in the process, my first marriage ended. My children and ex-wife resettled in Australia. I wanted to stay in South Africa because mm. this to me was exciting. Yeah. And um, I literally, I lost my business, wound that up, and I had to start again. And um, from that point on, things started going differently. But I had that 18-month period, which was my long dark tea time of the soul, which was a lot of introspection, mm. what's really important, what is the legacy I want to leave behind, how, I, how do I want to be remembered, mm. um, as opposed to just barreling through life, ticking boxes, and thinking that... Now you've achieved. Yeah. But I mean, with all of this story, I don't want to give the wrong impression to people as if you had literally just been going through life without like aimlessly. You were a successful architect. 
Well, I, mm. I, I qualified originally as an architect and um, worked for a couple of architectural firms, but my first real serious job was after I finished my national service and I went and worked for the OK Bazaars mm. as a store design architect and then working on development of new shopping centres. Okay. And through some fortuitous happenings that were inside the company at the time, I actually moved away from the drawing board and I moved into the management of shopping centres, leasing, uh, financing, putting mm. together the, the whole structure of shopping centres. And shopping centres was my life for the next 20 years. Um, the time frame was when, when Granabout was this? Um, st started in 1985 and I yeah. finally left the shopping centre industry around 2005 okay. when we started skipping. So the, 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 the big boom, essentially. Yes, um, but it was also, you know, each, each project was a project which was interesting in itself, but a lot of it was cookie cut out. Mm. Um, I used to have a nightmare of waking up one day in a mall and looking around me and seeing Edgar's, Fashini, Pick and Pay, yeah. Woolworths, and I didn't know which mall I was in yeah, because yeah. everyone was starting to feel the same. Of course. You know, at the end of the day, it just was boring, okay. you, you know, for something you'd done. And I suppose coming from an architectural background where you are innovating and creating, uh, building spec houses that mm. all look the same, yeah. Um, you remember that old Nina and Frederick song, Little Boxes on the Hillside, was, yeah, all yeah. made of tiki-tacky. Tiki -tacky, tacky. Yeah. Um, it's that sort of thing because there's no real creativity in mm. that. All you're doing is photocopying. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, life and isn't cut and gonna, paste. No, of course. And that's the easiest way to style for your own creativity. Yeah. And then I guess in that, in my writing, assuming that like, that would have been a time where you would have even questioned your whole sense of why. Like, why am I doing this? What is it for? Absolutely. So it was an interesting thing that the whole question of why we did this exercise when after Maureen and I had met and we decided that skin renewal was actually going to be a business. Mm. When it started, it wasn't a business. Yeah. It was a side hustle. Mm. Um, and we weren't really serious about it. It was yeah. just filling a little gap. Mm. Um, and we sat down, I think it was in 2006, 2007, um, and we did an exercise that took us the best part of a day, which was why. Why yeah. are we doing this? Yeah. And it was interesting. One of the writers that I follow a great deal is a guy called Simon Sinek. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Simon yeah. Sinek wrote the Why book. Yes. But that came out about seven years afterwards. Are you kidding? And so we'd done this exercise on why. Yeah. And the answer to why you start a business, if the answer is in order to make a living, mm. you're in the wrong business. Yeah, yeah. Because... That isn't the why. Mm. So we had to figure out what our why was. The business then needs to be profitable mm. so that you can do what it is that you want to yeah. do. Yeah. Uh, money is not an end in itself. Yeah. Uh, it's just a way to keep doing what you do. Of course. So we, we finally worked out our why. Um, Maureen and I were both empty nesters. Mm. Um, my kids were in Australia. Her kids were in the UK. Um, our homes were pretty much paid, our cars were paid, we didn't have any serious expenses mm. and we had a lot of time on our hands. Okay. Um, and if we had to sit and look at each other for 18 hours a day, um, eventually there's going to be conflict. Yeah, so we needed to do something with our time. Yeah. And skin renewal was one of the things that came out of that. And the why was really we wanted to make a difference. We mm. wanted to create a business which had legacy and we wanted to have an effect on other people. Mm. So the idea was to facilitate transformation of people, mm. whether they were patients or whether they were the people that worked for us. That process of transformation was a really important thing. Intrinsic to that. Okay. And, and that was really the rationale behind why skin renewal was started. Okay, so now at this point, um, after your big sort of like transition in life, you then obviously met your current partner, Dr. Maureen. And at that time, again, she was also working as a doctor and a few days of the week she was taking on patients for aesthetics, correct? I think it evolved to that. So originally, Maureen was one of the very first doctors in South Africa who started using Botox. Okay. And it was simply something she read about in a medical journal in around 2000 mm. that one of the side effects of Botox, which was originally used for... Uh, Neurotic, neurotic tics or okay. spastic tics oh, yeah, yeah. or clubfoot okay. and to relieve tension, that one of the 
byproducts, uh, side effects of Botox was that wrinkles started disappearing for a period. Very beautiful. Uh, and Maureen read about that <laughs> yeah. and she had a daughter, still has the daughter, who used to frown. Okay. And Maureen always used to put magic tape on her forehead uh, yes. to stop her stop. frowning. Yeah. And she thought, well, this is a way to stop my daughter frowning. Yeah. Uh, she didn't know that it's not supposed to be used on children. Of course, yeah. But so she went it to It was in the beginning. We did not know as much as we do now. Absolutely. Mm. And she just started doing it. She's got six sisters. Mm. So her six sisters became her patients and then their friends. Yeah. And she was working in executive health, doing mm. medicals. Yeah. And one afternoon a week, she would take off and she set up a little surgery at home, mm. and then she would see the odd patient, and it was a side hustle. Yeah. Um, but fortuitously, and we live in a complex, mm. and in most complexes there is a resident in the complex who I call the curtain twitcher. <laughs> mm. I think I know an, what you mean, yeah. That's an, <laughs> generally an older lady who's very frustrated with life and spends her life twitching the curtains yeah, and she's very, she to find something to complain about. Yeah. Yeah. And our curtain twitcher decided that Maureen was running a business from home mm. and Maureen got a cease and desist letter from the body corporate yeah, yeah. to say that she was not to run a business from home anymore. Mm. So Maureen said to me, well, what do we do? I've got to go and get an office then, otherwise I've got to stop. Yeah. So we went and... So got she turned a, to the property guy. Well, you know, I was still doing my property business and then she needed an office and we got a little 30 square meter office and mm. we put a cupboard in it and a partition and a few things. And um, that opened on the 7th of the 7th, 2005, the day of the London tube bombings. Wow, yeah. And Maureen came home that evening and she said, you know what, this is not going to work. Mm. I said, why? And she said, well, if I've got to pay rent mm. and I've got to employ a receptionist, then I can't do that one afternoon a week. I have to start yeah. getting serious about this and I've got to take this business seriously. And to do it seriously, I can't do it in a 30 square meter office. I need to employ a therapist. I need to get equipment. I need to let this business be able to grow. Sorry to, to interrupt your train of thought. Was this motivated by just pure ambition because she could see the potential or because there was like a lot of pressure from clients who wanted her time? No, the, the, the client pressure wasn't there, but, you know, simply if she was going to start spending money yeah. on rent and staff, mm. um, like scale, then, scale needed then to she had to take it seriously. Yeah. You, you can't finance a business by working one afternoon a week, yeah. um, not with the cost structure. Mm. So it was really out of need. So... That weekend, we went and bought an old, old, broken-down house in Parkhurst in Johannesburg. Um, Casually. Which, go for a walk on a Saturday. Oh, yeah, I'll buy that. We, we found it and we went to the bank and we asked them for a bond and yeah. we didn't have uh, bonds anymore on our own properties. Mm. So we, we got a bond on it and I spent the next year demolishing, rebuilding and setting that up. And yeah. the idea was that Maureen would then close the little office yeah. that she had and she would move into the house and that would become where she practice, worked. Yeah. And we thought that was the end of it. The patients, however, thought about it differently because the office was in Rivonia, mm. but the house was in Parkhurst. Mm. And the Rivonia patients that we had now got over that first year yeah. said, I'm not travelling to Parkhurst mm. to come and see you. So Maureen said, well, I'll work in Parkhurst in the morning and in Rivonia in the afternoon, and then the next day I'll start in Rivonia and switch across to Parkhurst. So we thought that was it. And about a month after that happened, we heard of a doctor who was, had started an aesthetic practice in four ways and he wanted to sell it because he was getting divorced. And he didn't want the proceeds of the sale of his med medical practice to go into the divorce settlement. Course, yeah, yeah. So he wanted to do a buy it now but pay later, yeah. which is a good scheme. Yeah. So we bought that practice and mm. now there were three. Mm. Uh, we still didn't realise this was a business. Mm. It was just both of our entrepreneurial streaks yeah. that we couldn't resist the challenge. And at this point you, you were not part of the business yet. So it was round about that time as that third branch open because mm. Maureen was now splitting her time between three branches. There were no systems. There were no computers. There was no brand. There was absolutely nothing. Mm. And Maureen was just running 
left, right and centre and her life was becoming impossible. And she said, look, you've been saying you want a new challenge. How about you take this on full time yeah. so that I can focus on patients because that's, that's what her, I do. That's her passion. Yeah. So that's what we did. And um, we thought it was just going to be the three. Mm. And then there was a fourth and each decision we made was always made in the total belief that this was it. Yeah. And then the business grew, so the decision became the wrong decision, and we had to reinvent it and reinvent it. And it's taken 18 years, and uh, gradually over 18 years, the business has built up and... A little bit. Yeah. And <laughs> it's become something which is really terribly exciting. How many branches do you have now? So currently there are 18. By the end of this year, we'll be at 20, which will be, and I've said this many times before, that will be it. So <laughs> it probably won't. Um, it, yeah. But we'll see what, what opportunities there are. Um, so that's an average of a new, a branch, a new year. branch a year. Which is certainly not rapid expansion. Uh, what do you mean? No, I mean, some, some businesses, they try and grow three, four, five outlets in a year. Um, and that's exceptionally difficult, especially the logistics. And, you know, our, our business is not a cookie cut up thing. It's, mm. We have an interesting challenge in Skin Renewal because on the one side, because we own the entire business, mm. everything has to be consistent. We have patients who come to one branch in the morning because yeah. it's near work, yeah. and then on a weekend they'll come to another branch because it's near home, and you have to have the same offering. Mm. So like McDonald's, yeah, the yeah. burger has to be the same. Yeah. Nobody chooses to go to a McDonald's outlet because their burgers are better yeah. than another no, McDonald's outlet. Yeah. So you have total consistency. The problem is in McDonald's, Nobody knows your name yeah. and there are no relationships. Yes. So we have to be like a Michelin 20-seater restaurant where you know every client, you know wow. everything they want, yeah, yeah. and it's very personalized, but you are consistent. Yeah, you have the McDonald's and it's, consistency. And it's yeah. keeping that balance between those things that is the challenge. Mm. It's very easy to grow, but to grow consistently yeah. um, is a challenge. Okay. So now over this time when you've grown, which – at a rate that I actually think is quite staggering because you don't only have to just create like a branch. It all has to be beautiful and also it needs to mean something. And you need to then train the staff that's going to basically be able to understand your brand, live it, and then translate it to the customers. I think that's a huge feat. So like for me, like in my world, I think that like one branch a year is actually a lot. So congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank but, you. Um, added to that, you must have had to, I don't know, at some point have to reckon with the fact that we needed systems in place. Maybe we didn't know, know enough about, I don't know, like things like websites, like some kind of tech. And that is the kind of like pivotal time when technology was becoming like a, a resource you couldn't ignore. What was the sort of like challenges that you had to deal with? So I, as part of my property background, yeah. I used to consult to a company called Digital Mall, a guy called Yaron Asabi, okay. who was one of the pioneers in South Africa of um, online retail. Mm. And this is pre-Google. Mm. So uh, Digital Mall started about three years before Google was founded. Okay. And I was doing consulting work to him on the psychology of shopping, mm. why people shop. Okay. why they act the way they do, where do their eyes go, do they turn left, do they turn right, what colours do people respond to. Because mm. there's an entire psychology involved in the process of shopping and yeah. retailing, mm. how you merchandise, um, what you're wanting to achieve. Mm. So I had a very, very good exposure to the very early days of digital. That's literally between 1998 and 2001. And um, so one of the things that I said to Maureen is that when we set this business up, we have to have a digital interface. I have never liked the idea of being dependent on outside consultants because when they don't perform, it affects your business. So one of the decisions we took right at the beginning of the business is we were going to try and do as much in-house as possible. I had a certain level of expertise but I also had to find people or train people mm. to start using the technology that we had. So we now have a marketing team of nine people that are full-time. 
Uh, we produce video, we do editing, we do copywriting, we do photography, uh, we run our own websites. So all of those things are in-house where you don't have to depend on outside companies to do it. Mm. And you can get it done exactly the way you want. The cost of building that infrastructure is serious. But once you're up and running, it's cost effective yeah. because you're not paying a margin to someone else to do that work. Uh, I never really quite know what it is that I've booked to get done. But the email that reminds you that tomorrow you have a treatment with this person and this is what you're having done is something so small and yet it's so useful. We use a very, very simple philosophy. We mm. treat ourselves as patients. Mm. Uh, we recently did an exercise with our assistant managers. We had a conference for them and they all got sent into the mall at Mall of Africa in yeah. Johannesburg and each one of them had a task to do, which was a difficult task as a consumer. They had to go into Ackermann's and ask for a refund on something that they purchased, but they didn't have a slip. And Or they had to ask for something that the store wouldn't have. Mm or ask for an appointment at a time that the store wasn't open. And they had to go and be consumers. And then they had to report back on how they experienced it. Because what we want to do is make the consumer's journey as simple as possible. If they come in to see us, they're coming in to treat a problem. They're not coming in to fill out paperwork mm -hmm. and everything. I've always had a philosophy, whenever I've changed banks, I go into the bank on the first day and say, right, today, you have me here. All the papers that I ever will need to sign, Must I will sign yeah. today. Today's the day for all the paperwork. And after that, you guys take care of the paperwork and I will just do a signature at the end. But I'm not here to do paperwork. Mm -hmm. So we try to do the same thing with patients. We treat them in the way that we would like to be treated. There's nothing worse than going to a till operator in a supermarket who's having a clear day, bad day, mm -hmm. and make sure that you know she's having a bad day. It affects the entire shopping experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're greeted with a smile and cheerfulness and a positive attitude, it makes the process of getting through the tills just a little easier. Yeah. So we treat people the way we want to be treated ourselves when we are consumers. And that's that simple. Well, having worked together as partners, at what point do you know where you start as business partners and at what point do you start as like life partners? <laughs> um, the fact that none of our children are at home anymore has mm. made that a lot easier. Okay. So there is no separation. Mm. Um, for us, this business is not a business. This is our hobby. Yeah, yeah. This is what we love doing. Amazing. So bringing that into the personal relationship is actually fairly easy. Um, yes, there are differences of opinion about things, but it's not that, you know, there's that old saying of if you do something you love, you'll never have to work. That is our experience. Mm. To us, this isn't work. Yeah. Um, waking up is an exciting thing every day for me because of the challenges, the people I'm going to see, what I'm going to do. Every day is exciting and different. And it really doesn't feel like work, mm. uh, which I did do for 30 years before this. Um, yeah. This is just having fun. Now, when you're having fun, you seem to prioritize your employees a lot. It's, it's something that comes up quite a lot. And I just want to also know, from an entrepreneur's perspective, what would you say to other entrepreneurs? How do you get to that point where you put your staff at the center? And why is that important to you? You know, a lot of these things may appear to an outsider as though I had a good idea. Mm. But the reality is it's all copying things that have been done many times. Okay. You look at someone like Richard Branson mm. and his books are full of it. If you treat your staff right. Yeah. Um, I've been in corporate. I've been an employee of a corporation. I know what it's like to be treated as though you're disposable and unimportant. I've worked in companies that didn't care if you had a sick child at home or your car had broken down. All the things that life throws us. Mm -hmm. So we've always said that, A, we've got to understand our people. We like the family mentality. I think part of it is because our families are displaced, both of our families overseas. Mm -hmm. So it was Maureen and I. And we had the opportunity to start our own family 
The difference is that when you start your own family this way, you get to choose who's in your family, whereas in your real family, you don't get to choose. It's luck of the draw, yeah. It's luck of the draw. (laughs) Um, So we've, we've selected carefully and we've managed to attract absolutely amazing people into the business and we treat them with a great deal of respect. We say to them that when you arrive at work, don't leave your life outside the door. You know, when you arrive at work, you have 10 people on your back. You've got a sick aunt, you've got your granny, you've got the taxi driver who cut you off on the way Mm. to the office. You've got all sorts of stresses and strains that you carry with you as part of modern day living. And that's part of who you are. Mm. And some days you're functioning at 110%, but some days you're only functioning at 50%. Mm. And that's okay. Then you say, today I'm only at 50%. I need a little bit of space. I need a little bit of time. I've got to go and take care of something. So let them incorporate their lives into the place that they work. Um, and that becomes empathetic to to how they feel. I wonder why corporations are so scared of that. Because the way that you're describing it, it almost feels like a win-win because then everyone would benefit. But a lot of corporations still run away from that. So do you think for you, when you decided to make it about your employees, that was like a eureka moment? Or was it because you had read in the books and says, cool, let me try this out? Or do you just feel it within you that, listen, I can't run a good business without... It it was simply a reaction to what had happened in my own life when Mm. I was an employee. Mm. And that was not the way that I wanted to be treated. You know, I, I remember, so if I look back on days where I did my national service or at university and those people who went to boarding school will also remember it. If you were in standard six at boarding school, you got bullied by the matrix. If you were first year at varsity, mm. you got hazed. Yeah. And that was almost a rite of passage. Mm. And when you then became a matric, it was now your turn to bully the standard mm. sixes yeah. or to haze yeah. the first year universities. So... Now that you become the boss, now you can treat employees the way that you were treated. Mm. And I just said, at some point, the cycle has, has to be, be broken. broken. Yeah. And it was a reaction to that, um, to try and create something different instead yeah. of keeping on perpetuating the sins of the fathers. Yeah, yeah, of course. So don't you also promote the culture here at Skin Renewal that like people shouldn't be like pessimistic <laughs> about the idea of falling pregnant because... Like kids are welcome and they should be seen as a positive thing. So you talked about the eureka moment. One of the aha moments that I remember very, very clearly is when Skin Renewal was still very small Mm. and we had four or five employees and a therapist came to me and said, Vic, um, I've got bad news, I'm pregnant. Mm. And I thought, hang on a second, Mm. there's something here that does not compute. If she perceives that having a child is going to be taken by me as bad news, then I'm the problem, not her. We need to change this because the reality is we employ 95% women and many of them, when we employ them, are between the age of uh, 18 and 25. So the chance that they are going to have children is relatively high. high. Statistically, we're going to have kids. And if I don't change this perception now, I am going to have a problem forever. So we developed our own way of dealing with the concept of maternity and whatever. Every baby is celebrated in the company. Mm. Um, Every baby gets photographed in a I'm a skin renewal baby T-shirt or baby grower. We've had 72 babies in the company so far. 73, 4, 5 and 6 are all in production at the moment. (laughs) And I'm sure that within the next month or two we'll hear about number 77. Because it's a celebration Mm -hmm. and we all celebrate it, it's amazing how the girls in the company have actually started working in a cooperative way Mm -hmm. where two people in a branch are maybe both wanting to fall pregnant and then the one does and the other one says, okay, well, I'll wait a couple of months so that Mm -hmm. um, I'll look after the branch while you're having on maternity Mm -hmm. and then you can... And, you know... To, to simply look at the, the concept of maternity through legislation. Legislation says you have three months or you have four months of maternity leave. Mm. That's not realistic. 
because some people have a very difficult pregnancy. We've had girls who were not able to work after their third month of pregnancy mm. because they had a very complicated pregnancy. We've also had kids that were born. We had one child who was born and they spent 10 months in ICU. Wow. So, you know, maternity will be what it needs to be. Yeah. You can't go and say, no, it's got to fit according to a time clock. Yeah. You've got to deal with each person as an individual. Mm. Some people come back to work very quickly. Some of the moms, they battle, and they need to be eased back into work at a slower pace, mm. starting part-time and, and sort of weaning themselves off being a full-time mom. Yeah. Um, so you've got to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. And I guess like this is something that I guess as a message for other entrepreneurs out there that it's something worth considering because you seem to have very good sort of like staff retention. I remember the very first time I came to a skin renewal, um, it was 2017, I think, and it was the Cape Quarter one. Um, and since then, it's the same sort of like, or at least three of the faces are still the same people that I still see today. The reality is that Maureen and I are not known to many patients. Yeah. Maureen sees patients, but only at a number of branches. Mm. And the reality is that most of our patients don't know Maureen and I. Mm. Our staff are the custodians of the relationship. Yeah. And we we understand that. Mm. It's something that um, you and I were talking before this about the COVID, uh, what all happened in COVID. And although COVID was an exceptionally uncomfortable thing to go through in South Africa with the lockdowns and having to close the business, mm. it gave us the opportunity, instead of running around all day being busy, we were forced to sit down and think. Yeah. And the, the day after the announcement, um, that night Maureen and I were in a little bit of shock because essentially the business had closed and we knew the expenses were carrying on, yeah. but the income had ceased. Mm. So what were we going to do? And I said, well, let's rather just sleep on it and we'll look at it tomorrow with a clear head. Mm. So in the morning we said, well, the president says we're going to be locked down for three weeks. The president is a politician. Mm. Politicians, by definition, usually lie. So oh, it's not going to be three weeks. <laughs> so it will be longer. Yeah. How long? We don't know. Yeah. It could be four weeks. It could be a year. Mm. We had no idea. So we were venturing into the unknown. Yeah. What are we going to do? So I said, well, Maureen, if this thing plays out, eventually we will run out of funds yeah. and we will lose the business. Mm. What are we going to do then? And she looked at me and she says, well, then we start again. And I said, absolutely, I agree 100%. So let's take it as a given. The business is now closed. We've lost everything. We're going to start again. Do we need premises? No, because if we've gone down, a lot of people will, go, will have gone down and there'll be lots of premises available. So do we need equipment? Now, you can always go and get more equipment, get the financing, get more equipment. What is absolutely critical to us starting up if the business closes down entirely, yeah. our staff. Mm. Because there we have an investment in the relationships that our staff have with our patients yeah. that has taken years and years and years to build. Yeah. If we lose the people, we'll lose the patients. Mm. And then we'll be starting from patient one. Mm. So look after the people. The landlords can wait, the banks can wait, the insurance companies can wait, mm. everyone else can wait, the people is what counts. And that philosophy, it was self-serving, mm. um, but at the same time it took, took note of all the people that we had and that they were going to have a difficult time of it as well. So we put together a whole aid system. Um, number one is people who were alone and in lockdown were contacted every single day by people in the team because being alone is, it doesn't sound like it's more difficult than being 18 hours a day or 24 hours a day with your partner because mm. eventually you start fighting. Yeah. But when you're alone, it's really difficult. Mm. So those people were supported. We gave people legal advice on where they stood with the banks in terms of their bonds, their landlords on rent, cars on car payments, insurances and whatever. 
and let them understand from a legal perspective what what their rights were they could do and what they couldn't do and what their rights were um we created a whole treatment protocol for covid because at that stage you know if you caught covid it was go almost, stay at home and well, for himself we didn't know how serious covid was mm. and uh, the media was telling us you're all going to die, yeah. uh, which is scary stuff. So how were we going to treat our staff? So we came up with treatment protocols, which we gave to everybody, and we supplied things. And we used the time to continuously communicate with each other. Uh, we built very good bonds. We carried on with training. We did all sorts of motivational things right through it. And... When we were able to open up again, everyone felt as though they were a part of a team. Of course. And it was very, very different. And they were they were treated exceptionally well. As I say, A, because they deserved it, but B, it was also self-serving because yeah. it ensured the, the future of the business. So now one of the things that I've taken from this like, is the fact that like, by making sure that your staff is basically at the core of it, you've inadvertently, or maybe intentionally, created a brand. Because Skin Renewal now, the way that you're able to scale it, you only one person and Dr. Maureen is also one person. There was no real way that you could have scaled it to the point that you have without a brand. Was that intentional? Absolutely. Did it come absolute, at you? No, oh. Absolutely intentional. So when we had the discussion in 2006 and we realized we now needed to make this a business, mm. it needs a name. Because up until that point, it was Dr. Maureen. Yeah. And I said to Maureen, I said, at the end of the day, if you become the brand, then this brand is limited mm. because you can only be in so many places and everybody would want to see you. I remember when I worked for a firm of architects and their name was Stucky Harrison Incorporated. Mm. So a rep who would be trying to sell some kind of building material would phone and say, can I speak to Mr. Stucky? Yeah. We'd say, I'm very sorry, he's not available knowing what the next line would yeah. be, well, then um, could I speak to Harris. Mr. Harrison? Yeah. Um, no, he's not available either. Uh, when will they be in? Um, they won't. Mm. They passed away 70 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. so you, you become limited with a name. Mm. So we made a very, very conscious decision to create a brand which could grow, which was not dependent on a person. Mm. We could be the faces behind the brand, yeah. but at the end of the day, the brand had to take on a life of its own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is an ethos of its own, um, everything that is unique to that brand. Yeah. And building that has been a great deal of fun. For you, this is not an industry that you came from. And what have you learned and what has made you want to stick it out in this industry? Like, what do you perceive about it that you think is actually good for I don't know, the well-being of people? And what are the misconceptions that I think we might have looking at it from the outside? So if I go all the way back to the process of shopping centres, why did I choose in the property industry to be involved in shopping centres? Shopping centres is one of the few direct properties where the success or failure of a building yeah. is dependent on the people that use it. Okay. okay. Both the shop owners and the shoppers. Yeah. An office building is not dependent on the success of the tenants in the office building. Yeah. Because it's, it's just space which is used. Mm. But shopping centre space becomes very productive. Yeah. And some tenants are very successful and some shopping centres are very successful. So what you're doing is you're dealing with people mm. and understanding how people interact. Yeah in a commercial setting in the shopping centre. Yeah. So for me, skin renewal is still that. Mm. It's still people. It's understanding how people feel, what they want, what they want to achieve. And it's, I use the word feeling quite often, but when people leave our clinic, yeah. they must feel better than when they arrived because then it becomes a memorable experience and something that they want to do again. Of course. And to understand that, you have to be in touch with how they feel. Yeah, yeah. And that takes a lot of understanding. So then it, you mean it becomes less about making sure that they leave looking better. They need to feel better. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Mm. We've had people who are absolutely stunningly beautiful 
but lack the self-confidence because they don't feel good about themselves yeah. for something that in all honesty is immaterial mm. in the big scheme of things. Mm. But to them, that is important yeah. and it affects their self-confidence. Yeah. So you're really dealing with the psychology of how people feel and how they feel is very often dictated by how other people react towards them. Mm. If they're accepted, they get comments. Uh, and, you know, I had, a, I had a direct experience of this. So I, I came from old school. And when I met Maureen, and what do you do? And now she injects Botox. I said, oh, well, you know, you just carry on doing that because this is not something I need. Yeah. Every line I have... I have earned, yeah, yeah. there's a story behind yeah, it yeah. and I, I wear my it. scars with pride. Yeah. yeah, that's the story of my life. So I resisted and about three years after I'd met Maureen, because she was always on me and she said, you know, you really need to do something about those lines on your forehead. Yeah. And on a particular Sunday afternoon after a very, very nice bottle of Merlot, oh, when my inhibitions helps. were not yeah, yeah, quite yeah. at their <laughs> maximum, <laughs> Maureen got hold of me and she injected me. <laughs> yeah. And so I went through it, but three, four days later, I was still at my office in the property industry mm. and people started coming up to me and saying, have you been on holiday? You're looking so refreshed. Yeah. You're not looking as stressed as you normally oh, wow. do. Mm. And this was nice. People started paying me compliments. Yeah. And I felt good. Yeah. Um, then I got it. Mm. Then I got mm. it because it had nothing to do with the wrinkles. It was how people reacted yeah. to me. And, you know, we all know that feeling when we've bought a new outfit and you put it on for the first time. Yeah. Okay, when you've, as and for women particularly, as they leave that hairdresser and their hair is perfect, you feel great. Mm. You're walking on air. Yeah. You stride <laughs> through life and people just... You feel great. Mm. Whereas if your hair is straggly, you're in old clothes and whatever, and you haven't made an effort, um, those and clothes no never anything those listening. clothes never feel the way again the way they did the first time yeah. you wore them. Yeah. So our appearance is something that's it's real. Is it justified or not? That's a debate for another day. But the reality is that the world works on appearances. I People think, meet you yeah. and form an opinion of you within seconds of having met you. Of course, yeah. But I think if you reshape uh, it or refocus it to think that it's more about how you feel, Absolutely. It, it, it stops being superficial or frivolous because yeah. we all ought to feel good. Yeah. yeah, you know, and people come to us and they don't say, I want to lose this wrinkle. They say, I want to look less tired. Mm. I want to look less angry. Yeah. I want to look less sad. Mm. And all of these are facial expressions, which the interesting thing as well in the aesthetics industry is that it must be seen as a tool. It is no different to mascara or makeup or dyeing your hair. Mm. We chatted earlier about the program Mad Men. Yeah. Yeah. And there was this wonderful case study which they dramatized in Mad Men, which was the story of Clairol, mm. where when in the 1950s in the USA, for a woman to dye her hair was an absolute no-no. It was only women of ill repute yeah. who would dye their hair. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you were grey, then that was God's that was wish that you were grey and you wore it gracefully. Mm. And dyeing hair was not on. Mm. And Clairol introduced colouring hair. Mm. And they had to make it okay. And there was that famous ad campaign they yeah. did of did she or didn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which also tied into the fact that women like having a mysterious oh, yeah, yeah. side to expression in India. Yeah. So when you get media doing programs like botched and like dramatic surgery and whatever, and you show everything that can go wrong, mm. it is still perceived by many people as a stigma to do aesthetic treatments mm. as cheating. Yeah. No, it's a tool because if you dye your hair, if you use mascara or you use lipstick or you look at yourself in the mirror before you go out yeah. and you brush your hair, this is just another tool. Yeah. Very important to not form a dependency on the tool mm. and use it as a tool. It mustn't become, take on a life of its own. Yeah. Um, so it must be done responsibly. 
But do you perhaps think that like over the years, since you've had a bird's eye view into the industry, the perceptions are shifting and um, people are feeling more confident Slow. and comfortable? With Absolutely. It? So I'd, I'd tell a, a lovely story. We did a focus group in particularly trying to understand skin type six consumers, which is where the future of our country is. Mm. And we what, had what skin type is that? Dark skin. Oh, really? So you I'm a six. Be, you, you would be a skin type six. Cool. I am of North European extraction. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm in the sun for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. I'm already red okay. and I can feel burning. Okay. So, so it's the rate be, of... What you'd be, like a one. I'm, I'm a skin type one. Okay. Yeah. Did not even know those classifications existed. A skin, a skin type one would be someone of Celtic origin, very okay. often ginger haired okay. or fair haired, fair skin, burns very, very easily. Okay. So, and skin type six is... South Africa, of course, it's ninety yeah, percent yeah. of our population. So understanding that population, so it doesn't what, end there. Once you've conquered South Africa, you've got the rest of the continent. Absolutely, but we had this really interesting focus group, and it was a lady, black lady of about fifty-five, mm. who was a geologist by training. She had a master's degree and she had an MBA from Harvard. Wow. Main board director at Anglo American. Right. Okay. Mm. Seriously smart. Yeah. Much smarter than me. Oh. <laughs> and one of the questions she was asked in the focus group is, would you consider doing Botox or fillers? Okay. And she said, yes, but it mustn't alter my appearance so that my ancestors don't recognize me. Oh, wow. Aha. Yeah. Another one of those moments. Yeah. Did because not think that that answer was going that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay. nor did I. Mm. Caught me right out at left field. For her, this was a very important consideration. And this is a cultural thing. Yeah. Yeah. So she, it was okay to do it, but the ancestors had to recognize her. Mm. Her daughter was in the same focus group. Mm. Her daughter was about 27. And her daughter said, oh, mommy, don't be so silly. Mm. Yeah. So here we already saw the shift, but it was because of generations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a mother and a daughter had a totally different view on mm. one thing mm. um, because it's it's changed. So South Africa has always been right across from its cultural identity to the old conservative, biblical, um, Calvinistic mm. upbringing that existed yeah. in South Africa for 50, 60 odd years, mm. has been a conservative country. And that conservatism doesn't allow for aesthetics, but that is shifting, okay. absolutely. Yeah. The other area that has, we call it destigmatization. The other thing is that this is an incredibly fast moving industry. You know, I'd been involved in digital, so I knew the speed at which digital moved. Aesthetics moves even faster. Oh the rate at which new technologies and science is working and constantly evolving means that for us who are in this industry full-time and attend every conference, it is a full-time job just staying up to date. Mm. The consumer doesn't stand a chance. Mm. And the consumer's exposure to what is in this industry is via marketing. And marketing always tells the story to make it look good. Yeah. Um, so we also have to demystify it and bring it down to a level where the average consumer can actually understand what is happening, where the value is, what the trends are. Um, those are consistent challenges. So demystification and yeah. destigmatization is something we aim for, and education of the consumer. Now, when it comes to sort of like earning the trust, um, because the consumer, I think, can be quite trepidatious about getting, you know, work done. And because, again, like you've said, we've seen, you know, shows like Botched and Niptuck, etc. You know, was that the intent behind using doctors for a lot of the treatments instead of, because there's a lot of other clinics out there that use aestheticians, I think, which is like a catch-all kind of phrase, but without necessarily needing to be doctors. So, number one, when you're building a business on scale, yeah. Safety, safety of patients is absolutely critical. Mm. So a doctor is better placed to provide that level of safety. Mm. The other thing is doctors have insurance. Mm. Um, they also have the training. And a doctor comes with a degree of gravitas. When a doctor tells you to do something, you tend to listen. More likely to do it, because yeah. we have been brought up 
that doctors are almost a species of their own. We elevate them above us mere mortals. Mm. We give them a different title. Mm. And if you say to a kid, draw a doctor, they'll draw a doctor, give them a white coat, put a stethoscope around their mm. neck. It's iconic. Yeah. And a doctor is someone we take seriously. Uh, there's very few mothers who would be unhappy if their daughter came yeah. home one day and said, oh, mommy, I've met a lovely doctor. guy and he's a doctor. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, I thought you wanted to say, I want to be a doctor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or All I that. want to be a doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. We, we aspire yeah. to, to doctors. So mm. when a doctor gives the message, um, it's a lot clearer. Yeah. And a doctor comes with a degree of authority. Mm. And one of the things that we've had to try and figure out is how our doctors and our therapists actually work together as a single unit mm. instead of coming at things differently. Yeah. So the doctor and the therapist play a different role, but they are part hand of hand. the same team yeah. and it's how they work together. That's okay. critical. And so then if you were to outline what are the like the golden sort of like rules that makes you know skin renewal stand out? We care. <sighs> it's that simple. Yeah. You just gotta care. Mm. You've got to care about everything you do, you've got to care about every patient. You've got to care about every experience. You've got to give them time. You've got to give them energy. You've got to be focused on them. And you've got to understand them. You've got to be empathetic. Just care. Yeah. Um, most businesses would do significantly better if they, if they cared. cared. Mm -hmm. um, and the profit will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. If you've got nothing but happy people around you, yeah. um, it's going to come you've got all the wealth. Just that alone already gives you the wealth that, you would want, wow. um, but the money will follow. And then reinvest it, grow it into the business, create more opportunities. Yeah. See, I don't even know what our time is at the moment, but that's such a beautiful way to end. Like I could talk to you all day. We've run out of time, unfortunately, <laughs> but thank you so much um, My pleasure. for this time. And yeah, I love what you're doing. And I, mean, I love what you do. <laughs> we much appreciate it, but I'll be obviously tapping into you more in terms of your reading, but for now, I'll continue to enjoy With being pleasure. a huge fan of Skin Renewal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Victor Snyder, CEO of Skin Renewal. And you're listening to the Breaking Eggs podcast. Thank you for listening. Catch us next week for another episode of Breaking Eggs with Seth Shezzy. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe, like, and leave us a review. We would love to hear from you. Until then, let's break. Break.